Welcome to Stand Up Memories, another episode with a terrific guest, Harry Friedman. I am Peter Bales. I've never gotten this far before without being interrupted. And this is Jackie the Joke Man I can't Man even Martin. get a word edgewise. I know. What do you want to say? I have nothing to say. All right. Peter Bales, Jackie Martling, I would rather hear you Harry, say nothing. Harry Friedman. So you go on and on and say nothing. I say nothing, but at least I say nothing. Harry Friedman, I met first in Florida. He is a terrific stand-up comedian. You who, didn't meet him before me. I think I might have. Where did you meet him? Florida, probably. I have no memory. Uh, what year did you I see him? I don't remember when I met him today. Harry I remembers. Harry remember. I met you in Florida at the Diplomat Hotel. Right. Uh, Eddie Schaefer, an old vaudeville act, was running a show for about a year in the Little Room. I met you at one of Richie Minovini's uh, one-nighters. And I had a lot of relatives there and stuff, and I, and I met you at the The Purple those. Onion? No, I can't remember the name of it, but it was before he opened Eastside. Richie about, Minervini? Cinnamon. It could have been Cinnamons, maybe. Richie Me Minervini, and Richie Long Co Island Co comedian. I've got to that. clue our, yes. our audience in on yeah. this. Richie Minervini, Long Island comedian who started comedy, helped to start comedy here on Long Island. And that room probably was, was Cinnamon in Huntington on a second floor. Uh, and that's where Harry met Jackie. And what year would that have been? Seven, 79. Yeah. Winter I started 79. in 79. Yeah. And you started probably. I started in 79 in South Florida. Uh, Carrie Hoffman, who went on to run uh, Stand Up New York, started a club down there. And Al Romero, a, a Cuban American comic, started. And John Schuler started relatively soon. And Mac and Jamie came along a few months later. Uh, so the very first Was this at the Diplomat? No, this was at the Attaché Hotel, which was in Hallandale, not far from the Diplomat. Because I, I remember we were doing shows on Long Island, and me and Richie were co-producing some, and Jim Myers, and then at some point Richie took a break and he started, disappeared for a couple of months. He was at the Attaché Hotel, and he was the only pro on that show. And then he started emceeing the show for about two months, and then he moved, went back to New York. And that's when the, it was down there that he befriended Jackie Mason, who wasn't exactly burning it up at the time. And Richie was going to start the East Side Comedy Club, and he talked Jackie Mason into doing the opening week. And that's... This when is the start. history of stand-up comedy on Long Island and the South Florida connection. Richie Minervini. And all those guys... Like John Schuler made his way north, yeah. and uh, who who else did you say? Al Romero. Al Romero, a Cuban American and former police officer. And you know what I remember wait, about wait, wait, Al wait. Romero? Al, who was former police officer? Al Romero. No, no, no. Who he am I man. thinking? Who uh, who am I thinking of? Who was the former police officer? Cuban American. Former police officer, not J.J. Ramirez. Not J.J. Ramirez. <laughs> no, no, no. J.J. was a police officer. Yeah. I don't think so. Yeah. He, um, was, he was in the uh, vice squad. Yeah. But as a Cuban American, I remember yeah. you mentioned Castro, and a vein would pulse on his neck. <laughs> oh, Al. Al Romero. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I think he's still you out working. That, right? still, he's still around. I think he was a former police officer. No, I don't think so. I, uh, we're going to look I, it up. I'll, I'll tell you why. Because first of all, when he started stand-up comedy, he was working as a salesman, and he actually came up to Long Island for some kind of sales training for like a month or something. So I, okay. I think I would have known if he was a police I, uh, officer. All right, I got to look okay. that up. And I'll I still stay in touch with him a little bit. Do you? Yeah. He um, used to start his act in Spanish, and the, I remember the so English thing. audiences, the American audiences, would laugh and giggle, and he'd go, "No, no, 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 no," and then he'd continue in Spanish and milk it for all it was worth. Very funny opening. Uh, I, I remember him at the comic strip going up, and saying the f first few sentences in Spanish. And, uh, and he, then he looked at the audience and he says, I know what you're thinking. We got to listen to this crap in here too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Which yeah. really worked big time yeah, in yeah, Fort yeah, Lauderdale. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. Harry, you were part of that South Florida scene where yeah. comedy was just starting out. Yeah. And we certainly remember the much missed great late Dennis Wolfberg. Oh, yeah. And he told a story oh, on stage yeah, 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 yeah. about going over to your apartment or your girlfriend's apartment. I was dating somebody. 
And, was uh, that your apartment, the story? It was, it was the girl I was dating, her apartment, so I was staying there for a while. And um, <laughs> he comes over, we were writing together, and he goes and uses the bathroom. Oh, God, I remember the story. <laughs> so I had no idea. So that. the basic story is he goes to use the bathroom, and uh, he starts, he's peeing, and sometimes when you're peeing, there's a second stream, and so he's, her pocketbook was next to the bathroom, so he's peeing half in the toilet, half in the pocketbook. <laughs> so she, so basically the joke was, you know, she gave me chicken, I peed in her pocketbook. <laughs> but I can still remember Wolfberg, yeah. I was peeing in her yes, pocketbook. Yeah, yeah, the way he would do stuff. My <laughs> brother Bobby solved that, not solved it, but figured out why that happened. Did you ever figure out why that happened? And, and I could swear he's absolutely right. I think it's when you get, uh, how do you put it? I think it, y y your, your organs there have two purposes. So isn't it something to do with that? He said he was sure that from wearing cotton underwear and you'd get a piece of lint in the little Whatever I'm sure there's a medical name for the hole in your penis. Whatever Take the children called. out of the room, and but that little piece of lint would separate the streams, and it makes perfect sense because it didn't. It wouldn't happen to you all the time, you know. If it was a medical I'm procedure, skeptical of that I'm one. skeptical too. Yeah. Do you have any data? Send your answers to Box Fifty Eight, <laughs> Bayville, New York, one one seven zero nine, and the winner will get to see Harry Friedman perform one of his special shows that he does, and Peter's gonna ask him right now what those shows are. Well, you know, first of all, I'm not sure that's why. Dennis Wolfberg called it a bipedal stream, which I think is, is making up a word, and I'm not sure that's why we are occasionally bipedal. And, uh, but <laughs> Harry is not a, a terrific stand-up comedian, but he has something that he does that's pretty unique, uh, he does impersonations, he does, but, but not like a, an impressionist. He goes up on stage as Dr. Harry Friedman. Now, is this bad to break this? I understand most of your audience is in Ireland. <laughs> I so don't. This, this will have no impact. <laughs> and, and, and there's a thousand people watching this or so? We have lots of people okay. watching Let's this. Let's say show. there's thousands. a million people. Nobody remembers. Okay. Uh, right. I was on WFAN a couple of times as a fake sports fitness doctor. I was, and I was on Tim McCarver's radio show. I was a fake sports fitness doctor who also helped teams and athletes to cheat in sports. You know, like <laughs> spitball, you drink more milk, it creates phlegm, things right, like right. that. So uh, people, people it, do, it doesn't matter. So it doesn't matter. It's yeah. just fun. And Pro if any, proceed. So well, I'm just going to tell our audience what Harry is saying is, he performs as a stand-up as Dr. Harry Freeman, a doctor who also does stand-up, and it's very, very funny. But in the corporate world, you can hire Harry to do put-ons of business people. You want to elaborate on that? Basically, uh, I was on the road about 150 days a year, like year five to ten in my career, and I'm like, I didn't know this was the deal. And it was like, you know, it was yeah. exciting and interesting, but it was also kind of lonely at times and stuff. I was single, sometimes it was really cool. But sometimes, you know, I worked with a guy who was a, I worked with a guy in Alabama who was stuck next to each other for a week and I hated the guy and it's like, this is a nightmare. It, it, it becomes incredible drudgery. Yeah. yeah, you have great weeks, you have, you know, whatever. Um, so anyway, so uh, a friend of mine who you guys know, a comic named Jeff Justice, he got hired to do a corporate put-on. Wow, I've heard his name. He lives in Atlanta, time. and he does corporate shows, but not put-ons, and he also teaches comedy classes at the Punchline. So he got hired to do one, and he starts telling me about it, and I said, you're going to give it away too soon. You've got to suspend their belief. So he said, help me write it. So three weeks later, he sent me a video. I was like, I got it. This is me. This is what I want to do. Like and straight I, stuff for X amount to, until they're completely convinced? You basically do it... What I've learned how to do, initially when I started doing these, I was serious for like a minute or two, but you dig a comic hole, it's like a balance. So what I learned to do is I learned to be funny without talking about anything to do with the company. Hey, it's nice to be here, blah, 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 and joke around about you know the, the place or joke around about stuff and 
you know, like a straight speaker would do. To do like to they say, the a straight speaker always introduced with a little a a few laughs, yeah. and that then everybody yeah. wants to hear what you got to say. So, and then I learn the stuff like I'm studying for an exam. I, I just, I, I literally go through the website. I talk to them. I send them a question. I talk to them. I learn names. I learn uh, personality quirks. I learn everything about the industry that I can, everything about the company. And then I start teasing with stuff that's real. So they go, and this guy knows his stuff. And I usually have gone to Harvard. That's something I pride <laughs> myself on. Uh, that's a fantasy yeah. that you're... If you're going to make it up. No, you got to go. you got to go for it. So let me just say to the audience, yeah. corporate events that pay more than your comedy club, oh, yeah. uh, they hire Harry to come in as an executive or a professional or an expert, and he does the put-on, and it looks real, but it gets weirder and weirder as you go along. Is that fair? Well, weirder and weirder, and funnier, but funnier, and funnier and funnier. And funnier, yeah. The game plan is to get them laughing up front, and then the transition point where it's like I'm getting into their stuff. There's a point where they're going, where is he going? And now I'm basically separating my image of deadpan seriousness from the material, which keeps going further and further out. So <laughs> and slowly but surely, this guy and then this woman, they're like, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. The in their mind. You know? The average person says 20 minutes in is when they kind of figure out, like, I don't think he's real. But I do have people coming up to me every so often <laughs> Are you really starting out here next week, or are you really consulting? They never office? quite get on the... Even though I reveal it at the end. I actually <laughs> say it, but... But they what, still don't believe you at here's, the end. Here's what I've learned, and you can see this in society. Packaging and presentation is sometimes more important than what you're saying. Uh, if you package it right, the head of the company or somebody important introduces you as real, they, they will believe that <laughs> longer than they should. They bought it, and it stays bought. For most of them figure it out, and then I say that I'm a fake very towards the end, you know, at the 35, 40 minute park, I joke about that, you know, and I joke about, you know, they hired me so they could clean out your desks and bring in all the new trainees or something like that <laughs> um, uh, to distract you. But, but basically, I, I love doing the writing. It's a pain in the neck, but I really do love going up there like with all that stuff. And I have a podium and I have my notes. I rehearse the hell out of it. Um, and I screen it with the clients, so like, okay, can this guy take a joke or not? Is this okay? Has anybody not taken a joke? Yes. Uh, tell oh, that me about has, that's yeah. gotta happen. That yeah. has to happen. Early on, um, <laughs> very early on, I did two shows for Huntington Hospital. I was still learning what I was doing, and um, I was doing too much roasting of the guy who was supposed to be roasted, and he was retiring. And I went into much too long on each person. I was killing. I was absolutely killing. But in the middle of it, this woman who was working there, a nurse or something, broke down in tears and said, come on, what are you doing? We love this guy. And she broke down in tears in front of the whole crowd. <laughs> so this the, the, the person complaining, you weren't attacking her. You were attacking her friend. And she was like, I wasn't like, attacking well, him. Ed, I was, well, whatever I was you'd call it. Roasting him yeah. as part of my thing. Don't pick on my friend. Yeah, 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 yeah. So she had no idea. I think she was emotional because he was retiring and this and that. And, and she, she had didn't no idea it. that I was a fake. She oh, didn't so get it. She, she didn't, didn't get, get it. it. No, 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 that's got to yeah. That's funny now, yeah, but at yeah. the time it must have been. No, it was, uh, you know, I, I, I was uh, stumped at that moment. Like, what do I do now? Um, and I, I forget how it ended. I just know I was having a great show <laughs> until that moment. You know, exactly. it's so odd. I, a, a couple were both divorced, and they were from Long Island, and they were getting married. They had both gotten divorced, had gone through the real fancy wedding, the family, blah, 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 and they were getting married in Washington, D.C., and they hired me to come down there, and they gave me all the information because they wanted me to roast the members of their family. Right. And I had no idea that no one was in on it except that couple. Uh, and I got up and I started making fun of uh, Aunt Judy, who was so cheap, and little Charlie that won't come out of his room. And at some point, you realize they're the only ones laughing. Right. You know, and just, you know, the egg on your face. And like, <laughs> you know, talk about take the money and run. Yeah, yeah. But like, it. it it's very uncomfortable, you know. Even even if it was just that one woman, you're still like, ah, oh, you know, what do you do? do now you, you know the famous story about Johnny Carson doing two shows in Las Vegas, and the manager said, "Johnny, 
during your show. Drop these names in. Oh, no, Everybody's going to laugh. You know about I this. I never story. heard this. Oh, yeah. D during your show, drop these names in. Everybody's going to crack up. So Johnny drops the names in, and there's no response. No response at all. Uh, and, and he gets off stage. He says to the manager, there's no response. Why did I, you, you make me drop those names in? And the manager goes, oh, I, I, I meant drop them into the second show. <laughs> <laughs> Not the first show. Which is just I mean, which is just, which is just great. Just great. So now, now, Harry, you go up in your stand-up right. as Dr. Harry Friedman. Right. And it's very funny because this doctor is out of his mind if he's a real doctor. And you play a real doctor. People think I am real. I'm a real Any, doctor. Any, yeah. like, specific, like, a gynecologist or a podiatrist? People ask me that. When women ask me, uh, you know, what kind of doctor, I, I, just, I just generally go, what do you need? <laughs> and uh, if you want a free ob exam, I have equipment in the trunk of my car. <laughs> um, but no, I, I keep it vague, but then during my set, I mix in the fact that I do surgery. I actually did five operations today, and I had a, I had a good day. I was two for five. <laughs> and uh, the other three didn't have enough insurance, so the hell with them. Um, <laughs> whenever great. I do surgery, I use a lot of extra anesthesia. This way, even if I screw it up, I'm so stoned, I don't really care what happens. <laughs> So I go on and on with that kind of stuff, and um, it's a lot of fun. And it's people fun. figure it out at No, the, uh, most people aren't sure, and a lot of people still think I'm real, because it's like a doctor could joke. There are doctor comics. Right. And so everybody's so nervous going to the doctor or getting an operation or yeah. something. It's a great release, whether it, Harry. You know, what happened is I started doing corporate put-ons, and I was like, okay, I can do this. I'm doing every industry. I've done finance. I've done tech. I've done... Uh, medical, I've, I've done nuclear, three nuclear facilities, which is pretty cool. Wow. And, um, and so I finally said, you know, I gotta put, figure something out for my act. Now obviously we all know Jim Myers, who started becoming the German. Now, I don't know that that directly influenced me, but I, who's to say, but I finally said, you know what, I could be a doctor, I could be a convincing doctor. And I also had an angioplasty around the same time, so I wrote a lot of medical jokes. So, Harry. It fit. It wow. fit. I never told you this story, but I swear it's true. I was an outpatient. I had a, a cyst on my thumb removed. And Somebody I had asked to, you if they knew me. Okay, here's the story. Okay. So I was under, and it's just not, not a big operation, but you know, they put me to sleep, and they operate on my thumb, and you, you know, you're in you recovery. You got anesthesia so they could take a, a boo-boo off, off your my thumb. thumb. All right, and you wake up from... Uh, whatever the Michael Jackson juice is, you wake up and you're out of it. You're out of it. You just slowly wake up. And my doctor comes over and he goes, the surgery went great. And then my doctor knew that I was a comedian. Right. And he had asked me, he, he goes, I want you to talk to another doctor. I mean, another doctor? She, he brings over a woman who's another doctor in the facility. And he goes, talk to him. And I'm, I'm totally out of it. And she says to me, I saw a comedian who was a, a, a doctor, and I want his name because I'm going to report him. <laughs> I, I'm going to report him to the medical board. And I'm coming out. Of, I'm just coming. I'm coming off drugs. I, I, I'm like, I'm like, oh, I, he's not. He's not a real doctor. He's not a real doctor. And she goes, are you sure? I go, no, he's a comedian. What a great advertisement when, for when your was act. This, this was ago. this was a couple years ago. Yeah. He's not a real doctor. Why didn't you tell me this? I forgot well, to tell you. I've told other people. It's so funny. Great I want to meet advertise. the woman. Oh, she <laughs> thought you were. Another doctor was so offended that the doctor would talk like that, initialing somebody's. What know, Harry doesn't know is she's here today. <laughs> <laughs> this is your. I would. I was on WFAN once, and somebody called up the station. I got a bunch of reaction, which was great. Some people wanted to buy the book, Cut to Win. As a sports doctor, um, and some and somebody called up and complained, you know, this guy is is a disgrace to the medical profession. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and they gave him my number, and he and I talked to the guy, and he said, you know, you know, I I I, I, I may take legal action. I said I would really like it if you did. There would be <laughs> no greater publicity if you sued me. Fantastic. And then. <laughs> Everybody finds out that I'm a fake and they listen to the tape. I please, please sue me. Right, and how great, if, you know, if there you, if is that convincing. There is a Harry Friedman story that is very famous on Long Island 
among the comedians, and I hope it's true. I hope it's not apocryphal. I hope it's true. And you'll heart attack. Heart attack. Yeah. Heart attack. It's true. Listen to this. So. Okay, let me explain to the audience and then well, I'll hand off. I do off. not know this, this. Okay, Harry is up on stage and he's performing his stand-up as Dr. Harry Friedman. And he's in the middle of his act and take it from there. Yap Hank, across the street from the fire department, like a 50-seater or something, and I'm closing the show and it's going really well. <laughs> and about 30 minutes in, this guy starts like, in his chair, he goes back, and it's like, is he drunk? And he's right, he's right next to me. He's right oh, in front of me. Oh, jeez. And it wasn't, I, I immediately sensed, I don't think he's drunk. This is worse than drunk, because his chair went backwards, and he fell on the ground, and his wife or whatever is there. So everybody halts. Everybody, the show just halts. So a woman in the crowd, there's like a moment, and I'm looking, and I'm going, what do I do? But you're on stage as Dr. Dr. Harry, Harry Freeman. And I'm like, okay, I have like seconds. To, and a woman yells, well, come on, you're a doctor. So I immediately said, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not really a doctor. And I, and I, I was thinking, here's what went through my mind <laughs> in the five seconds. I used to be a lifeguard. And I saved a woman's life once. She passed out in the pool and I gave her mouth to mouth. She got sick of me. And that's how I met my wife. But uh, <laughs> anyway, I saved her life. <clears throat> and, uh, and anyway, so, so now I'm sitting there like three seconds. You're thinking all these things. And I knew like, OK, you know, Newsday cover, you know, comic doctor and the guy dies. <laughs> so, so we were across the street from the fire department. So the fire department got there in, in like two minutes with oxygen. and. The show's over, and the owner comes, what'd you do to my audience? You know, what'd you do to my audience member, whatever? He was joking. And, uh, but and did you jump down and give him mouth to mouth? Right? No, you I just... did nothing. I'm not going to, what am I going to do? But you couldn't really end your act, because you, you had to say to the audience, I'm, I'm not, I'm not I a real did, doctor. No, I stood up there, but basically, I stood up there, and, and it was like I basically, I, I don't remember what I said. It Tried was, to keep the calm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I remained calm. I wasn't, like, panicking, but I also knew, like, don't, don't do anything physically here. Uh, so they got the oxygen on him, and then an ambulance was there, like, within five minutes because the fire department was right across the street. I heard later the guy did have a heart attack, and he did survive. And uh, basically, uh, that's the story. Another time... At the wow. Bagel Boss, somebody got, a woman got sick when Chris Monty was on, and I was emceeing the show as a doctor. And uh, I forget what happened, but she was, you know, I forget if there was an ambulance or whatever. But again, I didn't have to say anything that time because Chris Monty was on stage, so I just hid in the, hid in the back. <laughs> wow. Well, I, I think it's something in your act that's causing stress or some sort of a well, physical It's only reaction. one time. <laughs> <laughs> well, twice, twice. No, Chris Monty was on. Do you on, really think oh, somebody right. would give okay. him... Okay allow themselves to have a heart attack just to get out of here in Harry's act? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. You know, Thank Harry, you very much. We always ask this on the yeah. show because most of the time, stand-up comedy is so much fun and the nights are so great. But comedians like to talk about when it went wrong. It's that's never it. gone wrong, ever. Ever. Uh, never. Them, anybody who knows Harry knows that's not true. Uh, and everybody we has, all have has our that favorite horrible, horror shows. The, fa the favorite horror show. I'll tell you the worst. I can't think of anything worse than somebody have, being up there as a fake doctor no, and somebody a having a heart attack. <laughs> I mean, no, I had a good show. He had a heart attack. Too bad. <laughs> right, right. That's not my fault. It's apples and oranges. I made him laughing. I made the crowd laugh. People came up to me. were very funny. It's too bad the guy had a heart attack. That was. I did my job. Um, the worst was about a year in at the Diplomat, held about 80 people, and Al Romero went on before me, and he did an hour because he had an agent from upstate Florida there. And uh. I had 20 relatives there sitting up front. Uh. And he did a friggin' hour. And he was my friend. It was like, I was like, Doing. He, he wore them out. He destroyed them. He he didn't have an hour. He had 20 minutes, and then he was talking to people for 40 minutes. So by the time I got up there, they were dead, and my 20 relatives are like, you know, and they're in the front. They seated them all in the front. And I was not at any level of experience uh, near where I 
knew how to handle that. So he did his funny 20 minutes up front and then, he did and then stretched it with 40 work. minutes uh, of... To impress an agent that he could do time. A serious violation of comedy etiquette. And then he was defending himself. And, I, and I, I've never fully told him, you know, like, what are you doing? I never really said that to him. And, and maybe I will after this show. <laughs> well, maybe he can so watch what, this. So what? So you're... I bombed. And my relatives were like looking at me like, oh, this is what you're doing? Because <laughs> okay. I, I quit law school three semesters in. My father wanted me to be a lawyer. He was a judge and a lawyer, and he was very prominent in Nassau. And it was like, oh, you go, go to law school or shovel blank for all I care. So I was pushed into that, and I went to law school, and I was like, I don't want to do this. I, I want to do something creative. I have comedy inside me somewhere. And he was a very good public speaker, and he was very funny. So I got some of that from him. But I took it into my own way from uh, a very neurotic, uh, struggling childhood. So I, it was like, I have to do something with this. Because I, I look at the world differently than most people. Good for you. Good yeah. for you. That's a creative way to use childhood trauma. And I, I got my comedy from my, my father. I think my, my baseline comedy from my father. I, I can totally relate to that. And uh, Harry, look for Dr. Harry Friedman whenever he's advertised. He's such a funny stand-up comedian. And you don't use Harry Friedman when you're doing a put-on at a, at a... I change my name most of the time so they can't Google me. Right. So right. I change it. I either change the spelling a little bit or I change the name. I did you don't do, do like a wacky Mad Magazine play on words type? No, no, no. no, no. I'm... I'm I have to be corporate straight. I also do roasts now where I come in pretending to be like a relative of 23andMe or the guy's oh. doctor or something where it's like from work. Uh, the best thing I ever So did, you're a ringer. I'm a ringer. Ringer. The, the best in that situation was this woman hired me to roast her multi-millionaire real estate husband who had been in jail <laughs> in, twice in his life. In the 1960s, he was the boy wonder. He was in Life magazine. He made like 20-something million dollars. He moved the money around incorrectly. He fled to Brazil. <laughs> he started converting currency. He made $100,000 in a year in Brazil. Came back, served two years at Rikers, traded <laughs> cigarettes at Rikers. There's a book about the guy. Traded cigarettes at Rikers to get by. Got out, made a fortune again. Went back to jail when he was 60. <laughs> got out. Met a couple of partners, made a fortune in real estate. He was 85 years old. His wife was 60, and he had married her 30 years early. And you could tell when she was young, she was stunning. Right. So she hires me to fly to uh, uh, Cabo. And uh, I'm staying in the suite that Governor Richardson's staying in the next night. So I had a full-time butler. I got a free massage. <laughs> and that night, I am introduced as somebody from a real estate ethics board giving him an award. <laughs> and he's 85. He's 85. And he's a great shape. And he's, they flew like 70 of their closest friends from Arizona where they lived. They, everybody went to Arizona and they chartered a plane and they flew them all to uh, Cabo to stay at this incredible... This was the best resort at Cabo I've been in and I've been in about three or four of them. And... Um, so I was joking about, you know, it's nice to see him here without the ankle bracelet for <laughs> change. And uh, it was a weird setup. It was outdoors. It was kind of weird. They had like a ba uh, they had this singer from France come in and after me. But it was a, it went well. It went well. Not an easy situation, but it went well. Um, that was a great gig. That was just a great oh, wow. gig. Wow. Wow. Yes. You got to come on again with more stories. This has been so much fun. And you got to give us the guy's name so we can, you know. I not, don't not, think he's, I think he passed when he was about 92 or so. That gig was about 15 years ago. But it's so. an interesting story. I like yeah, that, you know. Yeah. I met a lot of people and I've been sitting next to people like Michael Dell or uh, I've sat next to, uh, uh, I was, did the American Bankers Association, 600 bank presidents. Um, and on the other end of the spectrum, yeah. you've performed uh, a lot at Bagel Boss. No, I, so do, I do open mics at <laughs> happy little dive bars right, and stuff. Right, 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 right. And That's so this business, one night you're, you're, in, you're royalty, and the next night you're a little crappy dive bar <laughs> with uh, six comics or eight comics that know all your jokes. You're only as good as your last. I used to go crazy because we, the Florida comic strip was one show a night but seven nights a week. Right. And we'd work 
to an empty house on Monday, and then a few more people on Tuesday, and a few more, and then all of a sudden you get the Friday is packed, right? And Saturday is packed, and everybody kills. But then you do Sunday night to twelve people, <laughs> and know. that's the flavor in your mouth when you go home instead of the the joy of the I Saturday know. kill. It's like it just lets all the air out of you. And you carry know. that into your Sunday show. I'm great. And then in the Sunday show, it's not like, so fair. Yes. In the no, Sunday fair, show, yeah. you got to get psyched up in a different way, and it's very yes, difficult right. yes. to get psyched yes. up. Right. Your forty-minute show is all of a sudden six minutes. <laughs> <laughs> you know? yeah. Oh, yeah. Harry, you've been great. Thank uh, you for having me. Oh uh, well, thank you for coming on Stand Up where, Memories. Where do I, who do I hand the uh, the uh, no, it's free. The edibles to? No. Uh, oh, I already did mine. <laughs> <laughs> this has been Doctor, because it seems appropriate to call you that. Harry, and I know your middle name, Harry Dilbert Friedman. That's my stage name. That's his stage name. My real name is Biff Wilson. <laughs> That's a great joke. Did he say Dilbert? Dilbert is my middle name, and Harry Dilbert was my grandfather, who I never met. He owned about 80 Dilbert's grocery stores back in the 30s and the 40s. He died. The brothers destroyed the business. My mom never saw a dime. On that so note, isn't Dilbert a comic strip? Is Dilbert a comic strip? Yes, yeah. How'd they destroy 80? The two brothers uh, just basically ran it into the ground. <laughs> they just, they, I they, thought you were minding this store. I yeah. thought you were no, minding. No, 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 they, 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 uh, I don't think they got along. And he was the glue. And when he died, they took over. And they also did some shady stuff. That I'm hearing, I have a, a great <laughs> aunt who I've learned more. Time's up, so let's go. No, 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 no. Okay. We're gonna have, we got well, Harry's well, you'll come back. back, for okay. sure. You gotta come back, man. Uh, Harry Dilbert Friedman, or better known as Dr. Harry Friedman, or better known as Totally Fake. I like Dr. Dilbert. That has Dr. a nice Dilbert. ring to it. Harry Dilbert Friedman. I have been Peter Bales. This has been Jackie the Joke Man Martling, and the podcast is called Stand Up Memories, and that's really what we do. Thanks for tuning in. And Thank you. Was, we'll uh, see you next time. We're all going to die soon, right? <laughs> <laughs> That was a pretty good episode. A new episode every Wednesday with me, Peter Bales, Jackie the Joke Man Martling, comedians, interesting people. Leave a comment. We'll, we're gonna we'll get, we'll get uh, what am I saying? I don't know. We're gonna get back to you. We will respond to your comment. StandUpMemories.com, if you go there, it shows all the different all platforms. Oh, Spotify, we're on everything. Every Wednesday. Stand Up Memories. Every Wednesday. A new episode.